Well, thanks so much, everybody, for having me. Really excited and honored to be here. Um, I do owe you all an apology for having to reschedule at the last minute a few weeks ago. I was not feeling well, but I am back to it today and really excited to be here. Um, so thank you, Jay, for the warm introduction. Um, I put a little about myself, but I think Jay said it all. So without it, with that uh, out of the way, we will jump right into it. Okay, so I'll start with a quick quiz. Can anybody, you can just shout it out, recognize the uh, gentleman on the far left of the screen here? Anybody know who he is? Shout out. Charles. King Charles. King Charles, good. What about the guy in the middle? King Charles. What about the guy on the far right? Yeah. King Charles. Perfect. So why did I start with this? So recognizing faces is a very human-like ability. There's no real rhyme or reason to it, right? I could ask you, how did you know that's King Charles? And you might be able to come up with an explanation for me. Oh, I've seen him before. Oh, I looked at the bone structure. Oh, I've seen that hairdo. I assumed because he was sitting on a throne. You might be able to come up with an explanation. That's not how you really knew. There's just something inherent in the human brain that makes you really good at recognizing faces. So I like to say that recognizing faces is one of the most human-like abilities that we have. So what does that have to do with the topic today? So what is AI? At the end of the day, artificial intelligence is a marketing term, first and foremost. So when I hear companies say, we're using machine learning, we're using artificial intelligence, 99% of the time, they're just saying that because it sounds cool and it helps them raise money from investors. At the end of the day, the definition of AI is very ambiguous. It's when a computer behaves in a human-like way. So, for example, facial recognition, like what many of you have on your smartphones, is a form of AI. Why? Because the computer is performing the human-like task of recognizing a face. Anybody and everybody wants to use the term AI, that's all it really means. So how does this happen? So I'm gonna put a lot of uh, math up here, but hopefully it's pretty easy to follow. So it's training data, statistics, and learning algorithms. Let's break it down so it's not mysterious. What is training data? No AI is born just knowing stuff. AI is designed using lots of examples of what good looks like. So if I wanted to build an AI that can recognize King Charles, I would have to give it thousands and thousands of images of King Charles that I'm saying, hey, this is what you're looking for, learn it. The AI cannot learn on its own. You need examples to train it with. That's where the training data comes in. Statistics. So does anybody know what this uh, graph I'm showing here is? Any mathematicians in the audience? Trend line. So almost all AI that you see in commercial application uses statistical techniques that have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. There's some very basic statistics, usually some form of regression analysis that allow the AI to say, okay, I've seen a thousand examples of King Charles' face. Let's see how well this new example I'm trying to judge matches up. So it may sound like pretty good stuff, but we've known this stuff for a long time. Learning algorithms. That's where the magic happens. So we've had training data for a long time. We've had statistics for a long time. Where the learning algorithms come in is they are essentially a set of instructions for the computer that teaches it to apply what it already knows to a new situation. That's the magic of being human, right? You may not have seen uh, a friend of yours or a spouse of yours in the exact same hairdo or the exact same clothes, but you're always going to recognize them even though the situation is slightly different. Learning algorithms allow computers to do that as well. So when you combine those three things, you can make computers act in a very human-like way. So I'm not going to go into all of this, uh, mainly because we don't have time. But something I want to point out to you is this idea of facial recognition uh, that we've been going. So facial recognition on your iPhone is surprisingly simple. 
So does anybody recognize that formula with the triangle on the bottom uh, left? Yeah, that's Pythagorean. Pythagorean theorem. So very few people know this, but the Pythagorean theorem that you learned in grade school is what makes Face ID on an iPhone or any type of facial recognition really possible. So we're using stuff developed thousands of years ago in a cave, just in a very exciting way. <laughs> Where was the cave? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about this idea of neural networks, right? So now we're taking it a step up. So what neural network does for machine learning or deep learning is it attempts to simulate the way the human brain thinks. So if you bear with me, right, the human brain does not think like a computer. When you catch a ball that your friend throws to you, you're not calculating what's the trajectory of the ball, what speed is it going, where does my hand need to be positioned? Your brain's doing all those calculations, but not in the way that we are used to. And so back in the 60s, some very smart folks said, well, if we want to build computers that act like humans, we need to simulate the human brain. So they essentially took an approximation of how they think the network of neurons in our brain works and designed an artificial version of it called the neural network. And so what this does is this allows you to tackle challenges where you don't have a formula. So there's no formula for facial recognition, right? There's no formula that says if the measurement between the eyes is X, if the nose width is X, it's that person. There's no like real formula. So a neural network allows the computer to basically write its own formula for the problem you are trying to tackle. This is super, super powerful. Why? Because the things that have neat formulas, computers have been doing since the 60s. This allows us to tackle problems that are either hard to quantify or uh, hard for us to represent mathematically. I'll give you a great example, sentiment analysis. We have neural networks that can read a piece of text that you wrote and tell you, is it a happy text, is it a sad text? There's no formula for that, but just like your brain learns to pick up connotation, the neural network can develop its own models for what the sentiment of a text looks like. This is where all the cutting edge stuff is happening. Um, this is a very simplified version, but if you ever hear neural network, just think it's a simplified version of how we think the brain works. Oh, text prediction. So who here has uh, a smartphone? Most of us. So we've all experienced some form of text prediction where your phone is seeing what you're writing and it's trying to predict the next word. <laughs> that is a form of artificial intelligence, believe it or not. So how does this work? It is essentially being trained based on everything that you've ever written and also some training data of just language in general. And what it's doing is basically applying an algorithm and a formula to try to guess the probabilities of what your next word are, right? So every time that you type something in your phone, it's taking a guess, what are you gonna say next and suggesting it to you as word prediction. It's nothing magical about it, right? It's really just taking basic probability and running it through a formula. We're gonna get back to this, but the reason I use this is because Chat GPT, what we've heard about, computers talking, computers writing, is nothing more than this on steroids, like I like to say. Okay. So there's something really interesting that's in the media right now. This idea that AI is not explainable. So you often hear people say, we don't know how the AI works. We don't know how it makes its decision. The AI has a mind of its own. Anytime you think that, or you hear that, I want you to take a step back and really see what's going on. And I want to show you by way of an example. Can anybody describe the two functions that are on the screen to me in one word? And if you've seen my slides already, keep it to yourself. Anybody would take crack at it? You look like you do. Uh, I'm saying they're probably waves. Curves. Waves. Okay. Waves, curves. Anybody else want to describe them somehow? I have the coordinates on the, just on the graph. Coordinates on the graph, okay. Do you want to? What do you sense? All right, I like it. So if I advance the screen, now can we describe it in one word? 
Right, ready? All right. So what's my point? Um, my point is this. Whenever you hear people say AI is not explainable, that's not actually true. It's just that we struggle to understand what the models are because we don't think like computers, right? The AI says, this is how I did it. Here's the function. But if you don't graph that on a two-dimensional coordinate plane, you're not going to see the heart. And so there is nothing mysterious happening with AI. There's nothing underhanded happening. We just have to find new ways to explain the data. Now, I'll give you two perspectives. So my career has been in the HR tech space. So we use AI to help screen resumes, screen applicants, all these things. The law requires that we explain how we make our decisions, and we do. Most people that tell you an AI can't be explained, what they're really saying is they don't want to explain it either A, for marketing purposes, or B, because they don't want their competition to see how their system works, or C, which is the most popular, they don't want you to know how it works because you'd be concerned about the data about you they're using to make their decisions. So a lot of times, what I want to tell you is there's nothing mysterious going on. There's no black box. Usually people just don't want to explain it, um, but all AI is explainable. Okay, so chat GPT. Everybody heard of chat GPT here? Okay, perfect. So how does it work? What's the magic? So chat GPT is essentially an AI application that mimics what it's like to have a human conversation. The magic of chat GPT is that it can turn a question or a prompt from a question like what is the capital of Pennsylvania to a sentence fragment like the capital of Pennsylvania is. Once it turns it into a fragment, all it does is use the text prediction, just like your phone, over and over again to make what seems like a conversation. That's literally all it does. So ChatGPT is just a machine that emulates human language. It's not actually thinking. It's not referencing any facts. It's just guessing what word would come next if a human was talking. All it is. And there is some degree of randomness in ChatGPT. So you can ask it the same question and get two different answers because it randomizes a little bit to make sure that you always get a new answer. So that's ChatGPT and that's how it works. Okay, so now I wanna talk about what I think are the three biggest sort of ethical issues with artificial intelligence today. The first one is intellectual property. So all of these AI models that you've seen are essentially trained on publicly available data on the internet. So ChatGPT consumed some percentage of all of the internet and some percentage of all books ever written. That's how it learned what human language looks like. Now, here's the problem with that. The people that wrote the books, they don't get any credit for it, they don't get any say in it, right? What if they don't want their words being used to train the model? Just like art as well. Right? The artists that put those pictures up there, they own that copyright, that's their work, but people are using it to train their models. Right? And so in a world of AI, the lines of intellectual property become very blurry. Could they sue? Sure, they could. But what, is everybody going to sue? It's like impossible to enforce. Now, I bring up the writer's strike here, because if you've been following it, I'm not going to say AI is at the heart of the writer's strike, and Los Angeles thinks it's not. But one of the terms the writers are fighting for is that one, the studios cannot use AI written work. And number two, the studios cannot train AIs on work written by the authors. These are two really important terms they're fighting for. <clears throat> the other thing that's pretty big right now is AI generated music. So there's a lot of people that are taking samplings of popular artists, dead and alive, and they're saying, listen, I'm gonna run every Billy Joel song through the AI and have the AI generate a brand new song for me. Billy Joel doesn't get any say in that, and Billy Joel doesn't get any of the money from the AI generated song, right? So what's gonna happen? I don't know. I think it's gonna be some combination of agreements between unions and some type of censorship online. For example, a lot of websites will not allow you to upload AI generated music. Is anybody gonna get sued? Probably not. Why? Because the people that are making AI-generated music, uh, AI-generated videos, most of them are people just sitting at home doing it for fun. It's kind of hard to sue people when there's no money involved, right? 
nobody with real money on the line is doing this because it's a liability nightmare. So I do think one of the issues we have to consider is what does intellectual property look like in the new world? What does it mean to be an artist? What does it mean to own your own work? All right, is labor still valuable for production? So this graphic that I put up here used to be, maybe it still is, pretty popular in every economics textbook there is, right? The factors of production. So what's happening with AI is if you take one of the critical factors of production, labor, you're essentially allowing labor to be replicated by machinery, or what we might call hard capital, right? And so the question becomes, in a world where you can replicate a lot of labor using machinery, <clears throat> is labor still a critical factor of production in our capitalist economy? Some jobs are more exposed than others. On the right of the screen, or on the left of the screen, there's a paper that came out of Wharton a couple months ago about the jobs that they think are most exposed to AI, right? Is it true? Who knows? But we have to really think about as we start to knock out not just labor jobs, but what we might consider white collar or knowledge work, are we displacing people? And as a society, are we gonna find a good home for them so that they can continue to make a living? My personal opinion, most of what I've seen is that a lot of these jobs are gonna become AI assisted. What do I mean by that? A journalist may use AI to write fragments of a story or to start a story, but they're going to edit it, they're going to clean it up a little bit, and they're going to write a little bit of their own, right? What we do think is going to happen is people that are willing to work with AI are going to displace those that refuse to use it. I think that's absolutely true. So we need to really think about what does AI mean for labor, and what does it mean for American capitalism overall? All right, here's the final issue, this uh, idea of the third generation of weapons. So... AI is a very, very powerful weapon in every sense of the word. It's a very powerful, um, real weapon in the sense that you have things like autonomous drones, autonomous bomb systems, um, but you also have knowledge weapons, right? With a powerful enough AI and enough money, I can create an AI that will spam, you know, 2,000 comments on a YouTube video in support of a political candidate, right? And so you're not worried about the guy in his garage. In this case, you're worried about things like nation states and organizations that have the resources and the funds to weaponize AI and use this weapon. Even more so, we now have AI-generated cyber attacks. So we can train AI to look into a particular firewall and security system and say, hey, find the hole in this so that I can expose it. And so it really becomes an arms race of who is weaponizing AI, and how are we using AI to defend against those new weapons? I am deeply concerned about this new uh, wave of weapons. I think pretty much everybody is. What I'm not concerned about is the Terminator. I'm more scared of the people that are going to use this than the AI itself, and I'm going to talk about that next. Okay, so a few things to ponder. So we've been talking about what's called narrow AI. So the idea of this is AI built for purpose. This is the idea of general AI, which is the human AI, what you might see in science fiction. General AI is a very like interesting topic because we've been seeing it since forever, right? So what's the science behind general AI? Is it even real? I'll give you a few things to ponder. So what makes a sentient, right? Like AI at the end of the day can be boiled down to a set of functions and equations. Can you capture human sentience in equations? Depends who you ask, right? But I think it's a pretty tough sell. What's the difference between birthing an artificial general intelligence and having a child? I don't think there's that big of a difference in the sense that either way, you're bringing in something autonomous to the world that may act for good, may act for bad, but at the end of the day, you have some influence over. This next one, I think it's the next one, is really, really, really important to me. So we see a lot in the news about so-and-so says AI is evil, so-and-so says we should regulate AI. Look, this is just my perspective, but you should always ask yourself, what do people stand to gain from saying that? 
I will give you two things to think about. Number one, nobody wants to write a news story about the guy saying AI is great. You say AI is the next evil thing. AI is going to end the world. You have every major news outlet wanting to interview you. Those guys are going to go on speaker tours. They're going to get books signed. They're going to be interviewed in documentaries. They have a lot of financial gain for saying that. If you're a big tech company, you have a lot to gain too, because you have startups coming out of nowhere using AI that are eating your lunch and you can't catch up. So what a big tech company does as someone that's worked at one of the biggest tech companies in the world is they say, let's push for regulation. We'll slow them down. We have the resources to lobby the regulation and comply with it. They don't. So I always, want to, I always want you guys to ask yourself, when people issue these warnings, think about what they stand to gain by doing. Now, there's a corollary to this. What do I gain? What do I stand to gain by saying this to you? The answer is not much, right? Because I'm using the popular opinion. You never gain much from the popular opinion. It's the contrarian opinion that pays. Uh, two more things that are kind of related, right? Like a lot of people think just because artificial general intelligence comes out, they automatically assume that means it's endowed with will, it's endowed with a sense of self, it's endowed with a sense of awareness. That's not necessarily true, right? Just because something can mimic human intelligence does not mean it will have all of our human dispositions. It probably won't have a desire to be free. It probably won't have a desire for sense of self. It probably won't even know it exists, right? And it actually raises like the theological question of is our sense of humanity or the soul, is it housed in the machinery of our body or somewhere else, right? If you believe that an artificial general intelligence could develop all of these human traits, you're essentially saying that the sense of human is endowed in the body. I'm not here to tell you that's right, wrong, I'm indifferent. It's just something to think about when you think about your own beliefs. So I'll leave you with one more thing and then I'll open it up to questions. So always when I do talks like this, people ask me, oh, well, do you think it's gonna happen? Uh, I prefer to answer with what would it take for it to happen? Okay, so what I'm showing here is a very, very fringe science. What do I mean by fringe? I mean, it's not widely accepted. So there's a theory uh, advanced by one of the greatest computer scientists in the world, Stephen Wolfram. And the idea is very simple. It's that everything that appears complex to us can be boiled down to a set of very, very simple instructions. So if you look at the moving graphic here, we have a set of seven instructions. And with those seven instructions, if you run them long enough, you will develop extremely complex structures like the one in red. So what Stephen Wolfram says, if you can figure out the very simple rules that underlie everything in the universe, you can essentially replicate it. This idea is not popular because Stephen Wolfram applies it to physics. He says general relativity is wrong, general, like all of the equations are not true, it's this. Most people don't accept that. But here's what is factually true. This is true about human language. If human language could not be boiled down to simple rules, ChatGPT would not work. So what ChatGPT tells us is that there is a very, very, very simple structure at the heart of human language. It's just not simple in the way our brains think about it. But if you're a computer, you can think about it very simply and replicate it. So here's what I leave you on. Um, it may be that there is a very simple structure to human thought. And if we can discover what it is, we will create artificial general intelligence. There's a lot of barriers to that though. Primarily, we don't even know what thoughts are. We don't even know what consciousness means. But if we can discover the structure, we will create the artificial general intelligence. So what's my answer to the question I always get? Artificial intelligence is far away, but probably not as far as you think. So with that, open up the questions. Yeah. On the way over um, on NPR, there was a story, um, to, to current, I guess, um, where there's a law, lawsuit or something, and an attorney um, submitted a brief citing a uh, case precedent that he wanted to cite <clears throat> his behavior, uh, whatever. And all these detailed case, case cases. And it turns out that these cases were were fake. They were uh, ChatGPT generated. And luckily, um, 
they were without you know, a judge or whoever looked at the other, I guess it was the attorneys on the other side, dug into it and realized they weren't. But so that's kind of scary that people could use, I guess scary because people have to, can't take face value and have to you know, research everything to see what's what's a deep fake. And so my immediate biggest fear about all this is the loss of truth. I mean, we're seeing it already. Um, I find with myself when I'm reading whatever my news feed is, what was the source? Because it, it's, oh, that was tantalizing. I, you know, I don't know that. Well, maybe it actually didn't. And all that whole video is fake. Or the, So the loss of truth, how do we, you know, <laughs> knowing what the... I love that you raised that. Thank you. A couple of thoughts, right? So remember, ChatGPT is just a language machine. So ChatGPT makes things that look like citations, but it's not doing any research. So if that lawyer understood how this thing worked, he would have never used it. Um, the second point, this is why I don't think AI is going to take our jobs, because at the end of the day, you need a human to vet what came out of it and say, this actually fits the situation. This is true. This is actually useful. Um, number three, what I tell the people that work for me, is I tell them, don't use ChatGPT for anything you're not already an expert in because it makes a lot of mistakes, and most dangerously, a lot of the mistakes are subtle. And if you're not already an expert in the topic, you will miss them. Um, now to your point about the loss of truth, we've been talking about fake news since before AI came out, but there is a silver lining, which is that all AI is pretty much detectable. So we can run things through algorithms and tell you pretty reliably, was it generated by AI or not? My guess is that over the next couple months, we are going to see a lot of new sites and things implement some kind of filter that checks yes or no, this was AI generated. And I think that's going to help. Um, but at the end of the day, right, that's only one piece of it. The broader question, I think your guess is as good as mine as to what we do. Yeah. So you might have seen the 60 Minutes special um, that on AI, I don't even know if you saw it. They, they used those filters in a classroom situation and it picked up somewhere of 70, 80% of the people that did generate a paper in, in this classroom by AI and was able to detect some of them that falsely detected. It wasn't, it was far from perfect. It was good, but far from perfect. If even a fraction of that data or that material was able to get out there back to Maggie's point, how do we know it's real? Because even our systems can't be sure. And, and if it can generate a trillion news articles in a millisecond, even a fraction of that is dangerous sitting out there for people to cite as real information. It's a good point. Or a fair point. So I'll give you two things to do. Good problem. Fair point. So I'll tell you two things to think about. So the number one is remember that that example was done in an academic setting. So what do students write about? Students write about things that have been written 100,000 times over before, right? How many people have written a book report about The Great Gatsby? A lot. And so those filters essentially compare uh, how prevalent is certain combination of words on the open web to how prevalent are they in your paper. So you're in an academic setting, it's a lot less reliable because the topics have been talked over to death. The second point that I'll give you is you're absolutely right. Some things will sneak through the filters, but people can write fake stuff online too. So I'm not sure how much deeper it puts us into the problem that already existed. So I'm very optimistic for those reasons, but that's not to diminish the concern. I think it's valid. And I think as a matter of policy, we need to address it. I just don't think it's doomsday like some people might make you think. Yeah. Hmm. And take a source of comfort in the ambiguity of language. Uh, one of the things you showed us uh, said, uh, AI refuses to take notes, the writer said. Well, if you think about it, that can mean more than just reading something and taking notes. It could be someone stole the material from my <laughs> notebook and notes, maybe there's the grades I got in high school and they're trying to take them. That is to say, you know, I was in my professional career is involved in language and I got caught on this ambiguity all the time. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. You know, language is inherently ambiguous and it's all part of the fun.
Was there a question in the back? Someone? Oh, you have a question, yeah. Is there any smarter person than all of us thinking about the idea that my computer is smarter than your computer? <laughs> And like Google saying, well, our inputs to our AI is better than Microsoft's yeah. AI. So our AI is going to be better than their AI because we have better stuff inputted. So two great, those are two great points. So first of all, training data is certainly an advantage. It is very hard to develop good AI models if you don't have a lot of data. The good thing is most of the training data people are looking for is available on the internet already. It's when you get into highly specific, specific domains that it gets harder. For example, nobody has the training data on financial markets that Bloomberg does. So that's definitely an advantage for someone like Bloomberg. Um, the matter of computing power, these things take a lot of computing power. ChatGPT is extremely, extremely expensive to run. You and I cannot afford to run it, but um, it's kind of like, if Google can buy a thousand CPUs, so can Microsoft, so can Amazon. And if I had something good to do with it, a bank would probably loan me the money to buy a thousand CPUs too. So it's not really a hardware race. It's just really resource intensive. And if you care about the environment, you know, a lot of those CPUs produce a lot of waste, produce a lot of pollution. And so people say like, how much power is this stuff going to use? No one really knows. All right. Oh my God. So we have two more questions. Okay. Why don't you pick them for me? Oh, uh, and go ahead. Uh, question back. I saw um, a Sunday morning program where they would use the artificial intelligence to preserve the history of the Holocaust and in terms of in the person that was alive, they answered all these questions, like over a thousand questions about it. So when they passed, the person, somebody can come up to them and ask all the questions to know about their life. <laughs> That's a great way to use the information. So I'm wondering, what do you think about when it's used to preserve history? Because I think it could be used for other cultures as well. To get that information from somebody who will be passed, the next generation can learn that history. So I'll tell you something that's very personal to me, right? That addresses your question. So I started journaling probably a year ago. Why? Because when in the past, which is hopefully no time soon, somebody will be able to take my journals and train an AI model that's just like me. They'll be able to train a mind that thinks just like me, talks just like me, acts just like me. <laughs> and so in some way, that preserves who I am on Earth, right? And so with enough training data, you can make models that emulate people people that have passed, people that are alive today, right? It's kind of like the portraits in Harry Potter, if you guys have ever seen that. It is possible, and it will get better. Now, the question that I ask for you is, those people didn't consent to essentially what I call AI necromancy, right? They did not consent to have their minds awoken like that. Is that ethical? Depends who you ask. But I think in the very near future, we're all going to have to put in our wills whether we consent to be reanimated or not. And it's going to be a very personal decision. Wow. Right, pick one more for me. Hey, go ahead, Frank. Are there how many different AIs are out there? And is one saying, wait a minute, I'm going to take this AI and, and change what's in that AI because my AI is better? Oh, yeah. I mean, so your iPhone probably has a couple hundred different AI models built into it. Um, so some are better than others, but it depends what you mean by better, right? And I'm gonna give you a really quick example and then I'll end on it, right? What do we mean by better? Humans don't recognize faces 100% of the time. How many times have you seen a celebrity in a different movie and been like, I didn't know that was that guy, right? A computer might recognize a face a lot better than you. So one person would say the AI is better because it recognizes faces more reliably. Another person might say, no, a different AI is better because it recognizes faces more like a human would. So it depends what you're using it for. It depends how you define better. But you have a world of options out there. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Enjoy. One more exercise for you. Okay. Um, so first of all, I mean, yeah, I love tech exercise. First of all, that, that, that may have been the most interesting conversation I've had. I've been exposed to in a long time.
Thank you very much. Okay.